When you have done all the things assigned to you, say, we are good for nothing slaves. What we have done is what we ought to have done. I remember growing up and hearing talks throughout my whole life, you are a good for nothing slave. And we would repeat that. We are good for nothing slaves. We owe our lives to God because he created us. From an early age, you're raised with no self-esteem, no self-awareness, no confidence. I didn't have prom, I didn't have birthdays, I didn't have dates, I didn't have college. You feel like you're robbed, like someone stole something from you. And you feel angry and justifiably so. My first memories as a child was being pushed in a stroller and going door to door with my mother, trying to recruit people. This is my book bag that I would carry around with me when I would go door to door, full-time pioneering, so just full-time knocking on doors and trying to recruit people. This brings back memories. It all started with my mom. We met a Jehovah's Witness, and they showed her a couple of scriptures from the Bible she'd never seen before. So at the time she was pregnant with me, I never had a father figure, she was mom and dad. I was baptized, and in here, I just found that I still have the T-shirt I was baptized in. It was in San Francisco at the Cow Palace with 10,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, like, watching. I was hyped and had to wear the white shirt because that means you're starting new. It's fresh. It's loose-fitting, so it's, it's modest. My mom was excited. I remember like even walking into the heated pool, something feeling like it left my body. I felt like I was dirty and I was restarting, so I felt clean again, and I felt something like a spirit had left my body. Like when I came out of the water, I felt, you know, I had a second chance at life um, because I was born a sinner. But I also felt a lot more pressure because you're basically marrying Jehovah God. You're just dedicated to him no matter what. You're always under pressure to, to be perfect and to set the right example. And, you know, every time it's not, it's something's wrong with you. I was like four or five. And it was your classic, you know, they're close to the family, trusted member of the family, you're left alone. I spent the night at his house and um, he took advantage one night and I knew I wanted to leave. I just didn't know what to do because I was four years old. He was 17, 18, so he's not super old, but he was old enough to know that like that was not okay. He said, yeah, don't talk about this. This is just between us. My mom comes from abuse. I guess I was saying some weird things and she's like, wait, what does that mean? Tell me what happened. And then she immediately like burst into tears and uh, set up a meeting with the elders. She shot to talk to them for direction, for everything. They told her the, the classics, like, don't talk about it. We don't want to bring a reproach on Jehovah's name, so we don't want to make the religion look bad. It's in Jehovah's hands. He'll fix it in the new system when the world ends and everyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness will die. And uh, they just pretty much dismissed everything. When I woke up, it was about a, a solid month of depression and sadness and crying and panic and anxiety attacks. I found out everything I was taught was a lie. Once someone starts learning about the group and it kind of hits them that they've been in a cult, there's a lot of trauma that can happen around that. Realizing that you've missed out on a lot of things in life, lost milestones, lost achievements and accomplishments, that's very distressing. A month later, I, I had my little DSLR that I had saved up for because I wanted to be a filmmaker, and all of a sudden I was free to like chase that. And I was like, I'm going to vlog because people need to know about this, and I just want to help 10 people. So that got me involved in activism with child abuse. I found this elder. I grew up with him. I had a past history and relationship with him, and I was hoping that this would trigger something human to come out. Should be some guys dressed kind of nice that just came in. Right here? Okay. Yeah. 
I think so. I was hoping to have some kind of proof and get a confession about my abuse. He said that he'd love to talk to me about the depression that I was going through and how I was feeling about my child abuse growing up. I've been having a lot of like nightmares, mm -hmm. flashbacks, and just solid amounts of depression uh, based off of some stuff that happened to me as a child. And I don't feel like it was handled properly. You just learn to live with it and, and put it behind you. Try not to bring it up, try not to dwell on it. And, uh, try not to bring it up or dwell on it. But then that's not yeah. dealing with the issue either. The same thing happened with my, my kids who have no clue my breakfast. If, that nothing there was done, if there's nothing done back in those days, like my kids were, nothing done, there's nothing can be done. And it makes you feel OK as a father? I can't change it. Number one, you need two witnesses. It just sounds like there's a lot of holes in the policies, and. I don't know what kind of holes you're looking for, kid. There's no holes in the policy. I guarantee there's no holes in any policy. Wherever your head's going with that, there's no holes in the policy. I know the names of the guys that hurt me. And ni neither of you have asked. OK, so there, there's... That concerns me. So that's not dealing with the issue, because if they're still out there and they're still around children, you got to take precautions to protect the children. Children we first, no matter do. what. Then why aren't you doing it right now? I don't think anything has changed in the organization. There's one of the most stubborn religious organizations where they just throw children's lives away like it's nothing. People need to know about this. There's no protections in place for children, and they're going to take the side of the abuser because there's no eyewitness. So nothing's changed.